Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us at whatever time zone you happen to be in. Uh, I know we have folks from all around the world, so it's not entirely appropriate to say good afternoon. My name's Kim Prisk, and on behalf of the organizers of the session, primarily Pooja Koji and uh, Nick, Nick uh, Ragani, I want to thank you for joining us. This session was programmed for last year, which of course didn't happen. Uh, and is entitled Quantitative Physiology, Modern Imaging Tools for Tackling Timeless Questions. We have uh, six speakers, and they're going to talk about things that I think people in, in the world of pulmonary physiology and pulmonary medicine have thought about for many years. But now we have new tools, uh, primarily imaging tools, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Pooja Kohli, and, she, and she's going to... Uh, introduce the first three speakers. The first three speakers are Taylor Winkler, Winkler, Eric Hoffman, and Michael Schaefer. They'll be followed, and, and Nick will introduce these folks, Susan Hopkins, Jan DeBacher, and Marin Tafai. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll remind you that your microphones have been disabled. And so if you have questions, please type them into the chat box, and we'll try to address them at the end of each, each talk. The talks are limited to the slots are limited to 15 minutes, so we may not be able to get to all of them. We'll do our best. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Kim. Um, well, the first speaker I'd like to introduce is Dr. Tila Winkler. Um, he is uh, at Mass General and Harvard Medical School, um, and he's going to talk to us about um, PET imaging um, and all its possibilities in um, looking at ventilation. Thank you for the kind introduction. and. I also like to thank the um, organizers of the meeting for the invitation to contribute to this uh, exciting session. So uh, the um, basic principles of respiratory physiology are well established, yet there are two distinct concepts related to imaging that are often overlooked. So the first um, principle is related to lung function testing and respiratory mechanics, where an airflow into the airway opening leads to an expansion of lung volume. So if you look at the, if you look at the total breath, the delta VL as the expansion of the um, lung during the whole breath is equal to the tidal volume. An uh, example of this would be if you take an end expiratory CT and an end inspiratory CT and fit it into a software for elastic image registration so that we can obtain a map of regional expansion in lung volume, a technical term is strain, which can explain the uh, transformation in lung volume from the end expiratory and inspiratory CT. This example here shows that the heterogeneity in um, strain is much higher in supine position compared to prone, and it's increasing over time in this animal model of ventilator and lung injury, ventilator induced lung injury. I think it's the, uh, the um, Strain map uh, is the right concept for this type of analysis because it links the expansion to the uh, magnitude of stretch that the tissue is exposed and that potentially causes lung injury. Another method is um, electric impedance tomography, a bedside imaging method using a belt around the chest with an array of electrodes that measure a field of impedances in the lung that can be reconstructed as a map of lung inflation and tidal expansion. So here in this example, we see a peep titration of the lung and a reopening of alveoli. So the images are courtesy Cairo Arosho Morris and Lorenzo Barra. In contrast to imaging of tidal expansion, there is the concept of gas exchange and gas transport. So the, what's different here is that the fresh gas is coming in through the airways, has to pass through the uh, dead space of the conducting airways to reach the alveolar space, where it's missing with the resident volume. So here, alveolar ventilation V dot A is equal to VT minus the dead space volume times the respiratory rate. We see that the VT minus VD is a magnitude smaller than the tidal volume that leads to tidal expansion. So one example 
is um, single breath inhalation of hyperpolarized helium for MR imaging. Here an uh, example courtesy Jean Fain, where the uh, inhalation of the tracer doesn't reach the, uh, the regions of the lung that we call ventilation defects, where airway obstruction occurs. If the subject then inhales a bronchodilator and the single inhalation of a tracer is repeated, we see in response to the bronchodilator that some airways reopening and are fully ventilated while other areas are partially uh, ventilated or remain somewhat constrained. But we can very well assess uh, the strong uh, response and ventilation heterogeneity that the tracer exposes or visualizes. So another excellent method, I think, is the oxygen-enhanced uh, magnetic resonance imaging, utilizing repeated periodic switching, we could say, between air and 100% oxygen to obtain a strong signal of oxygen wash in and wash out that can be used to estimate specific ventilation using MRI. So in this example image, courtesy uh, Rui Star, we see a moderate persistent asthmatic, 25 years old, and uh, the ventilation heterogeneity in his lungs. So in our lab, we have utilized uh, nitrogen 13 PET imaging. So nitrogen 13 is a gas that we dissolve in saline. We inject at the beginning of a breath hold, and then it reaches the alveoli, as you have seen in the animation. And during the breath hold, it simply diffuses into alveoli because nitrogen has a low solubility. And that image at the end of the, of the breath hold is the perfusion image. Now, when the subject resumes breathing, ventilation leads to a washout of the tracer. And I think from that example, you can appreciate the high sensitivity we have with PET imaging for tracer concentration and with dynamic PET imaging also for the kinetics. So we take for the advantage um, of the uh, matching the kinetics by taking the tracer kinetics of each voxel of the lungs and feeding them into four models. So we test four different models, two, one compartment model, single exponential and the gas trapping model, and then two compartment models that combine a single exponential with gas trapping or a, a double exponential uh, model. So in case of the two compartment models it is actually an assessment of sub-resolution functional heterogeneity that we get out. So we take the best uh, fit of those four models and advance it into the overall distribution or assessment of uh, parameters for the lung. Additionally, we take in gas volume and the location of each voxel so that we can derive specific ventilation, alveolar ventilation, perfusion, VQ distribution uh, among the voxels, and of course, then the functional and spatial distributions for the different parameters. So to validate the VQ uh, estimate based on that method, we had performed a couple of animal studies with highly heterogeneous ventilation and perfusion um, conditions in the lungs and could demonstrate that the um, arterial oxygen partial pressure estimated from the imaging derived VQ distributions could predict uh, the measured arterial oxygen partial pressures. So uh, about 20 years ago, when I joined uh, Rosé Lenecker's lab, we were very excited to apply this uh, PET imaging method to uh, ventilation imaging of um, people with asthma. So a subject with asthma during prong constriction or before and during prong constriction. So we had expected there would be some heterogeneity. However, we were surprised to find that the heterogeneity is highly clustered rather than scattered throughout the lung. Um, and we were somewhat confused by the, the clustering because the mechanism was not clear. Since there is heterogeneity inside the ventilation defect, it was clear that it was not an obstruction of a single upstream airway, rather than there must be constriction or several different kinds of constriction inside the ventilation defect. So that inspired a mathematical modeling approach where we built uh, airway mechanics into a mechanical mathematical model of an airway tree. 
And then we simulated an asthma attack in that model. We could demonstrate that there is a tipping point at which positive feedbacks lead to a local or regional clustering of severe prong constriction. And this uh, tipping point is, for example, modulated by the tidal volume of the subject, as this example shows you. So here I uh, made a 3D rendering of the um, tracer retention at the end of the washout. So this some substantial activity that is not washed out because of um, airway obstruction within the ventilation defects. I think the uh, 3D animation here shows better, we can uh, uh, appreciate more in detail the heterogeneity within the ventilation defect in this gas-like rendering. So since we have um, not only ventilation images, but also perfusion, we had noticed quite early that within the ventilation defect, there's always a hypoperfusion. So it was expected or it would be reasonable if airway obstruction leads to a decrease in the alveolar oxygen partial pressure, and that eventually leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction. So we designed a study where we took the lower quartile of specific ventilation, defined this as the potential ventilation defect, so we would not rely on other measures to define the ventilation defect. And we added a set of images at high oxygen, so 80% oxygen, to increase the um, oxygen partial pressure at the alveoli. And if that is successful, we expected that the hypoxic vasoconstriction should go away if that could explain the mechanism. So uh, panel C shows here that um, derived from the VQ data that we have, we had estimated the uh, arterial, no, not the arterial, the alveolar oxygen partial pressure. And with 80% oxygen, we were successfully um, increasing the um, uh, Oxygen, yeah, we see 80% oxygen, inhaled oxygen. We have successfully raised the alveolar oxygen partial pressure above 100 millimeter mercury for most of the conditions that we had, so that we would not expect they uh, cause a hypoxic vasoconstriction. Now, when we look at the perfusion, we still have for 80% um, oxygen a reduction in perfusion a little less than at room air, but there is still a significant reduction. So when we look then at the detailed data, we have many regions of the lung for the different subjects that participated that have clearly uh, alveolar oxygen partial pressures above 100 and far above 100, yet they have a reduction in perfusion. So subsequently, we also made estimates for uh, CO2 so that we can rule out that either, or we can say for sure that neither hypoxic vasoconstriction nor hypercapnic vasoconstriction can fully explain the reduction perfusion that we have. So the question is, what is potential mechanisms? And we uh, speculated about two. One is the dynamic hyperinflation within ventilation defects. And the other one is potentially the deformation of blood vessels that are running outside of the constricting airways. And by changing their hydraulic diameter, we may affect, or the, the constriction of the airway may affect also the uh, resistance, the vascular resistance. So these were two examples of uh, ventilation. And as a final point, I like to uh, uh, talk about this, an issue that's also coming from PET imaging, the relationship of lung density and tissue volume. So it's a conceptual equation that I wrote here to, to say that lung density has a density component that comes from blood volume and density component comes from tissue volume. When in this PET study, uh, carbon-15 carbon monoxide was labeled to uh, use to label red blood cells so that we can now compare the contribution of the um, total lung density in the upper left, uh, non-smokers in red, smokers in black, there's a substantial gradient uh, from ventral to dorsal. We can uh, separate the blood volume component, and we see that there is substantial gradient in the blood volume component. 
when we go now on to uh, look at the uh, extravascular density, there's a much lower gradient, which is the middle right. Uh, so suggesting that the blood volume had major contribution to total lung density. I think that has implications if we use lung density as a surrogate for tissue volume for normalization. And I think the challenge for us as an imaging community is either to find a better way to assess tissue volume, or we have to reconsider under what conditions using lung density as a surrogate for lung tissue is appropriate and where it's not. So as a summary, um, please differentiate between uh, imaging of uh, alveolar ventilation and tissue expansion. I think that it's important that we keep the two concepts separate. The magnitude is also different. PET imaging has a high sensitivity for isotope concentration and kinetics in contrast to the higher concentration or the higher resolution of uh, CT imaging. Using nitrogen 13 PET scans, it was possible to show that hyperperfusion and ventilation defects and asthma include an unknown contribution besides the hypoxic hypercapnic vasoconstriction potentially related to the uh, deformation of, of vessels or dynamic hyperinflation, but it remains speculation and I'm not sure how that could be te further tested. So last but not least, uh, remember that lung density includes a component, component of blood volume and tissue volume, which could be highly relevant if lung density is used as a surrogate for tissue volume in normalizations. So I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, particularly Jose Venegas and the long list of others who had contributed to the work that I uh, presented here. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tilo, so much for that um, discussion. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone who is listening that we are taking questions um, from the chat and I'm happy to relay them to Tilo so he can um, answer them now or throughout um, the session. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any any questions for, for Tila that we can take now. And I know it might take a couple minutes for everyone to process and yeah, ask questions yeah. in the Zoom era. Yeah. Um, so Tila, maybe we'll, we'll um, we can also keep moving and then we can, mm -hmm. I'm guessing things will come up as everyone listens to. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one question that came oh. through. Um, it's can you differentiate contribution to perfusion images between pulmonary circulation from bronchial circulation? Uh, the bronchial circulation does not contribute to the nitrogen 13 that accumulates in the alveoli. Okay. So we measure strictly speaking pulmonary capillary perfusion. All right, and again, chat's open for questions if they come okay. up. All right, thanks so much, Tilo. Um, our next speaker um, is Dr. Eric Hoffman, um, who is a professor of radiology and biomedical engineering at the University of Iowa, and he will be speaking about dual energy CT. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting symposium. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, quantifying perfusion using uh, dual energy CT and sort of give a state of the art of where do we stand and a few examples of, um, of how we're using it. Uh, just conflict of interest. I'm a founder and shareholder of Vita Diagnostics, which is commercializing lung image analysis software. Uh, just to give a bit of history of where we've gone uh, with CT to assess regional lung function, uh, as part of a group uh, back in the mid to late 1970s, uh, that not long after Hounsfield uh, invented and released uh, conventional CT uh, designed to look at a single slice of the brain or a single slice of the chest. Uh, we developed a two-story high scanner known as the dynamic spatial reconstructor, which consisted of 14 X-ray guns aimed at a hemicylindrical fluorescent screen looked at by a bank of television cameras, rotated at 15 RPM, and produced 
up to 240 slices of the body every 60th of a second. Now this was at uh, fluoroscopic uh, uh, resolution, uh, but it allowed us to reconstruct the lungs volumetrically, study them dynamically, and I'll show you some of the first images that came off of that of perfusion. Then not too long after came the electron beam CT scanner, which instead of any moving parts, bent an electron beam along a hemicylindrical anode, uh, uh, which then passed X-ray through the body uh, to uh, a set of eight rows of detectors so that you could get eight slices of the body uh, every 50 milliseconds. And then in uh, the 19, late 1990s uh, came multi-detector CT, uh, multi-detector row CT, where uh, instead of a single slice, you could capture up to eight, 16, um, 64, 128 slices of the body as it evolved. Uh, so if you wanted to study things dynamically, you couldn't get the lung, the entire lung volumetrically, but you could get enough z-axis coverage to sample uh, perfusion or ventilation, whatever you're interested in. And then along came dual energy uh, CT, where you, uh, in this mode of dual energy by Siemens, uh, there's two X-ray guns, and you scan simultaneously at two kilovoltages. And at the two different kilovoltages, the grayscale, reconstructed grayscale of uh, the normal body tissues are not appreciably different, but the, the attenuation of iodine uh, or xenon used for ventilation or perfusion is uh, significantly different at these two KVs. So then you can perform some mathematical uh, uh, separation of the iodine or the xenon to get an index of, of ventilation and perfusion. And the scanner, uh, the state-of-the-art scanner to date is the uh, Siemens Force scanner, which the improvements over the initial dual energy is the initial dual energy was really targeting the heart. Uh, the, the detector has been widened to capture the lung and also significantly reduces the radiation dose through a bunch of different uh, uh, implementations uh, so that radiation dose now for a volumetric perfusion scan of the lung is around uh, four millisieverts. So this is a picture of a little girl with pulmonary atresia image that went through a uh, patch repair and was still perfusing significant amounts of her lung uh, from the left heart uh, circulation. And the question was how much of that uh, the lung was coming from the left rather than the right heart. And so we uh, put the catheter close to the right side of the heart, injected a, a sharp bolus of contrast agent and scanned continuously uh, looking at, at that first pass kinetics through the right ventricular outflow tract or through the uh, right upper lobe, uh, lower lobe, et cetera. And you'll notice that uh, with each heartbeat, the brightness within the field of view, the region of interest goes up and down so that we realized that really to capture a, a time intensity curve, you had to gate to the electrocardiogram. Uh, and that's what we've done uh, since. So this is a picture coming from the Imitron scanner, a sample in the pulmonary artery, a sam several samples going from dependent to non-dependent lung. And you can see that uh, you get a sharp bolus of contrast delivered to the feeding uh, pulmonary artery. And then you get various uh, time intensity curves depending on where you are in the lung. And you can see this uh, 
slower time constants in uh, in the non-dependent region, faster time constant constants in the dependent region, uh, reflecting this gradient, supine gradient that's been well known uh, in blood flow. The Chan and uh, uh, in our laboratory published in uh, 2006. Uh, the study was actually done quite a bit before then, but the publication writing it was a bit delayed. Uh, uh, showed that that you could normalize uh, the calculated blood flow to the uh, regional air content, the regional estimated alveolar number, or the grams of tissue, and you would get different uh, vertical gradients in the supine or prone body posture. But regardless of which gradient and which normalization you used, uh, you still got this well-recognized uh, difference, supine and prone, where supine you have quite a steep gradient in blood flow, and prone it's uh, fairly uniform. Now with the Imatron scanner having a 50 millisecond scan aperture, we were able to deconvolve uh, the input function uh, in what I just showed you to get a uh, transfer function. And that transfer function was bimodal. And through a series of observations, we demonstrated that uh, this first very sharp mode was the partial volumed arteries in a voxel. And then the slower roll off uh, was the transfer function for the microvascular bed. So then we were able to actually make a map of the microvascular mean transit times uh, throughout the lung. Now using multi-detector CT, I'll show you just a few examples of uh, some well understood physiology. Uh, the multi-detector CT is still using uh, first pass kinetics uh, gated during a single breath hold gating the acquisition to the cardiac cycle, uh, but we capture much better spatial resolution than uh, we had with the Imatron scanner. And here you can see that normalized blood flow, so percent of total blood flow, uh, demonstrates this uh, well understood uh, supine gradient in blood flow. Uh, 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 in the normal sheep. But then this was a study where we happened to lavage the sheep with saline. And you can see that where uh, the saline settles, it's almost certainly hypoxic. And you can see the well-known phenomena of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, where the vessels are constricted, sending blood uh, to a better ventilated region. On the other hand, here's another sheep that uh, was lavaged instead of with saline, it was lavaged with endotoxin. And rather than get that hypoxic vasoconstriction uh, that we saw with saline, that in the face of inflammation, the normal response of the lung seems to be uh, to uh, block hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and in fact, enhanced delivery of blood flow uh, to that inflamed but hypoxic uh, region. Still using the first pass kinetics and the multi-detector uh, row CT, we gathered a set of uh, normal subjects, normal smokers defined by pulmonary function tests, and then divided them into uh, emphysema susceptible based on these little early signs of centroacin or emphysema, emphysema susceptible or smokers with normal images uh, without the emphysema. And here you see the mean transit times of never smokers and smokers with normal imaging uh, being about 0.46, the coefficient of variation of mean transit time. Whereas, uh, uh, 
the uh, coefficient of variation was almost double in the smokers with susceptibility to emphysema. And we believe that a portion of the population is unable to sense, uh, sense when hypoxia is due to inflammation and shuts off blood flow to those inflamed lung regions. And if you're shutting off blood flow to those inflamed lung regions, that then uh, you tend to develop emphysema. Now, for the first pass kinetics, uh, uh, it requires uh, qu quite a team because we have to put the catheter uh, right up in or near the right heart because you need a very sharp uh, input function uh, in order to calculate uh, true perfusion. So with the advent of dual energy CT, we implemented a new method uh, that calculates not perfusion, but perfuse blood volume. And uh, uh, so that uh, you slowly infuse iodine, equilibrating uh, the blood volume uh, with a fixed uh, concentration of iodine. And then you do dual energy, capture the regional amount of iodine, and that regional amount of iodine then reflects regional amount of blood. Uh, in that area. And we questioned whether or not the perfused blood volume reflected true perfusion. So in a series of pigs, we did various manipulations to change the regional uh, uh, blood flow. Uh, uh, and one of those was floating a Swan-Gantz catheter out and uh, uh, um, blocking blood flow. And you can see that the perfusion, true perfusion image and the perfused blood volume image in all of these looks nearly identical. So this is now coefficient of variation regionally of perfused blood volume rather than perfusion, again, in emphysema susceptible subjects versus uh, not susceptible subjects. And you can see this high coefficient, regional coefficients of variation in the subjects with uh, susceptible to emphysema. But if you give sildenafil, which dilates those hypoxic vasoconstricted uh, blood vessels, that they, this uh, susceptible subject begins to look like a not susceptible subject. So that high coefficient of variation is reversible. And then I'll just end with a uh, demonstration that uh, more recently, we take a total lung capacity non-contrast image and uh, uh, a perfused blood volume image at FRC. And then by knowing the amount of iodine, we can subtract the amount of iodine to get a virtual non-contrast FRC image. So matching TLC to FRC, we get an index of ventilation the regional Jacobians from that matching. And then from the um, perfused blood volume image, we have an index of perfusion. Uh, and then we express perfusion locally as a percent of total perfusion and ventilation locally as a percent of total ventilation. And then we can map out uh, regional uh, ventilation perfusion an index of regional ventilation perfusion uh, relationships. And just to bring it to uh, something near and dear to our hearts lately, uh, COVID, uh, that here's a subject that had, uh, was completely asymptomatic, had run five miles uh, before he came into the laboratory. He was a normal volunteer and found in our imaging to actually have COVID. He later was confirmed uh, to have COVID by a COVID test. Uh, and you see this patchy, poor ventilated region, poor uh, perfused regions uh, in a completely asymptomatic subject, uh, which over 30 and 90 days uh, uh, resolved itself. Now in the in intervening time, this subject volunteered for a Regeneron study. So we don't know whether this 
recovered uh, naturally or whether it was due to the Regeneron, but it shows that this gives a means of quantitatively assessing what's going on in the lung under pathologic states. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. That was really um, interesting and um, some fascinating information about COVID-19 at the end. I'm sure there will be lots of questions, which um, I encourage everyone to put in the chat. I think what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the next speaker and then try to take questions for the first three at the end of that, just for time's sake. So we make sure we get to everyone. Um, so okay. I'd like to... I'd like to introduce um, Michael Schaefer, um, who is at the University of Colorado um, School of Medicine, and he is going to speak with us about um, some very interesting ventricular and pulmonary arterial flow um, hemodynamic analyses that he's been working on. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just screen my, uh, share my screen. So moving from very, very too interesting, fantastic presentation involving uh, PET imaging and uh, CT, I'll perhaps provide a little bit of a shift uh, toward uh, magnetic resonance imaging and some of the state of the art, uh, I dare to say, uh, imaging techniques we use right now. And some of them which we're part particularly proud of here in Colorado, which are uh, flow-based uh, encoding uh, sequences, which give us the, this ability to not just quantitate uh, the accurately the blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature and through the heart, but also to appreciate some of the novel physiologic insights into f flow hemodynamics in general. I have no disclosures. So I just thought I would give like sort of a 40 flow 101 overview. Uh, we probably all have witnessed or at some portion of our careers encountered a 2D face contrast MRI where uh, we pretty much uh, apply velocity encoding the sequences to uh, quantitate a blood flow through any uh, large vasculature in our body where we simultaneously acquire both magnitude and face images. And because we can delineate where we want to actually uh, measure the flow, we can accurately delineate not just between pulmonary and systemic blood flow, but also between, uh, you know, uh, regular physiologic shunt. In the situations of physiologic shunts, we can truly appreciate a QPQS. And the math behind these processes are actually relatively straightforward. We segment the lumen of any uh, pulmonary or vascular contour and because we know the our pixel size and we know what velocity goes through that pixel, if we sum it up all together within any particular region of interest, we get the volumetric flow rate and we can accurately get amount of a stroke volume or net stroke volume through that particular region of interest. Well, when you take that technology, quote unquote, on steroids and you actually uh, use it for um, three-dimensional encoding for the X, Y, and Z directions, then you can actually start to appreciate the flow uh, going in uh, any anatomic region of interest. And you can truly appreciate the velocity and its three-dimensional uh, aspect and through the time, which gives it this four-dimensional or the 44 MRI title. Now we are not talking about only through plane imaging. We actually talk about a three-dimensional imaging. So we are not talking pixels, but voxels at this stage. And through each voxel, we measure velocity. And when we add all these imaging planes all together and throughout the whatever imaging or anatomical region of interest, we actually get our three-dimensional uh, uh, variability of uh, velocity encoding voxels throughout the time to arrive to something uh, something like this. And eventually, you know, bunch of cubes all together with velocity that won't tell us much. So what we use are these novel uh, projections using a path line on streamlined projections. You might have seen those, some of those before. This is actually a true path line reconstruction of a flow through the, through the mediastinum. So we see a heart nicely. And uh, this particular uh, subject is a patient with uh, Epstein anomaly who is a post cone repair. But this is just to kind of give you a taste of what uh, we can do today with the flow visualization where we can visualize instantaneously a flow through any anatomic region and do actually some nice uh, math and uh, physiology studies with it. Um, so today I would like to show you some of the results which we have uh, 
uh, collected in the field of, of 4D flow imaging and using some of the novel hemodynamic markers such as vorticity and viscous energy loss and volume partitioning and kind of introduce those hemodynamic measurements and also uh, correlate them to some of the pulmonary uh, uh, lung diseases, uh, which, uh, which we have been recently investigating. So first, vorticity. Uh, this measurement has been around for quite a long time and it's primarily used for the assessment of a quantitative diastolic dysfunction. In kind of late 2000s, early 2010s, the, there has been this notion that instead of using a standard uh, echocardiography, we should perhaps have a further focus on actually on the flow, what's going on in flow wise, because after all the echocardiography or even face or uh, MRI, dynamic MRI images, we are looking at the heart and we are looking at the tissue, but there is so much more inside and that much more inside is a blood flow. And throughout that blood flow, we can potentially appreciate uh, what's going on much more on the molecular and tissue flow, flow, flow tissue interface level. And what has been nicely shown that actually, despite having a uh, normal, normal ventricular diastolic or even systolic function, the flow can be very abnormal in this sort of a preclinical stage. So that's the primary uh, focus of using the flow imaging to kind of uh, detect using a flow abnormalities, what's actually going on in the sort of a subclinical level. And this was one of the primary uh, studies where uh, uh, one of my, earlier mentors, Dr. Fenster has looked at a 40 flow MRI and he looked at particular at the spin of the blood vorticity and whether it's abnormal in patients with pulmonary hypertension, whom we know have an import, uh, impaired preload uh, to the heart due to uh, just, you know, abnormal remodeled right ventricle. And what he showed nicely that this uh, vorticity or inflow parameters to the right ventricle, they are impaired, particularly the vorticity is reduced. And not just it's reduced, it actually nicely correlates with uh, some of the traditional uh, Doppler and tissue Doppler uh, imaging markers of, of uh, tricuspid, uh, um, tricuspid valve diastolic dysfunction. And it nicely correlated to a, such a degree that we were, okay, so now it's different, now it correlates, so what's next? Can we actually show it's better than, uh, than echocardiography and more sensitive? And uh, with that regard, we started to look at the vorticity uh, in patients with a more uh, known sort of a diastolic dysfunction in patients where the diastolic dysfunction is not well uh, established. And those were patients with a, a COPD. And we did a very similar sort of approach where we looked at the both left and right ventricular um, uh, flow. And what we looked at particularly, again, was that early peak diastolic flow velocity when heart is relaxing and the flow into the ventricle is quite, quite strong to kind of uh, give that the whole entire program or that whole entire protocol more sensitivity. And what we found out that when we looked at the old traditional markers of diastolic dysfunction, there was not much of a difference between patients with uh, echocardiographic based diastolic dysfunction, patients with a COPD and controls. Uh, but when we actually looked at the 4D flow based derived vorticity, vorticity actually nicely separated patients from not just from the controls, but those patients with uh, uh, very mild diastolic dysfunction and patients with COPD. Next uh, measurement I would like to introduce, and this one, this one is quite novel, relatively novel, uh, particularly in the field of congenital heart disease and, uh, and uh, pulmonary hypertension, and that's uh, volume partitioning. So about 10 years ago, the group from Sweden uh, has uh, decided to actually use this approach of particle tracking through the heart, through the cardiac cycle. And what they found out that actually flow through the ver ventricle can be partitioned into four specific components, which all cumulatively add to and diastolic volume. And those four uh, com components is a direct flow, which is a flow which has been uh, uh, stored in the left atrium before the cardiac cycle goes through the either tricuspid or mitral valve 
and comes out of the ventricle in one cardiac cycle. So that's very efficient flow. It enters the chamber and leaves immediately. It's not part of the end systolic volume. It just nicely goes in and out immediately. Delayed ejection or in a blue is a flow which was stored as a part of the, the end systolic volume, but didn't make it out in the previous cardiac cycle and now actually goes out. The retained inflow is a flow which was at the beginning of a cardiac cycle in the atria, but didn't make it out in the subsequent cardiac cycle. And residual volume is a volume which recirculates inside the ventricle. And that's a volume which is very inefficient energetically, as you can imagine. That's the flow which just recirculates typically in the apices of the ventricles and stays there for at least two cardiac cycles. How it looks like uh, in a uh, in sort of a four-dimensional projection, this is uh, this is the reconstruction and the sort of a color-coded color coding of those flow components. So you can appreciate where each of those components stay and leave throughout a cardiac cycle. And what's important again that these each of those flow components are associated with different part of uh, stored kinetic energy. The, the, the flow, which actually, uh, which as the blood fills the ventricles, it still has some of, the, some of the kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is very nice and sensitive marker of how, uh, of how ventricle or myocardium relaxes. And that myocardial filling itself actually is then nicely reflective of how much blood flow is there through the heart, but also how much kinetic energy is in it. And each of those four different particular flow components are associated with the direct flow that actually stores the most amount of energy, while the residual volume actually doesn't store any energy. And it's kind of like a static, stagnant blood flow inside the ventricle. And what's important is that, you know, in particular in pulmonary hypertension, there is this new notion of investigating uh, uh, dynamics, immediate physiologic dynamics in, in pulmonary hypertension with respect to clinical outcomes. And this was the paper from Dr. Rahagi actually from right before COVID, where they did this absolutely fantastic study where they actually used uh, non-invasive nitric oxide testing in, uh, in a patient with a pulmonary hypertension. And they did uh, immediate pre and post uh, uh, nitric oxide study and looked at the changes of uh, in uh, not just the the vessel radius but also the pattern through through the lungs before and after inhaled nitric oxide and nicely assessed uh, what uh, vasculature is responsive to reactivity and what's which is not and we were very much inspired by this and did something along the similar lines where we actually inside the MRI suite took a patient and uh, uh, did the baseline 40 flow MRI evaluation of this 40 or this four flow component analysis. Then they give them, uh, gave them uh, nitric oxide and while on nitric oxide actually repeated the 40 flow MRI sequence. And we did this in 10 children and compared uh, the pre and post results. And we also compared them to uh, healthy controls. And what we found out that uh, indeed the the, the right ventricular baseline flow is abnormal. And what we, what we found out that that residual volume, that volume which just recirculates inside the ventricle is impaired and it's abnormal, it's increased in pH patients and that efficient direct flow is actually reduced. Similar findings in the left ventricle. So it's not just about the right ventricle, let's not forget about that left one. Over there as well, the, the, that green direct flow was significantly reduced in patients with a pulmonary hypertension and that uh, inefficient residual volume was actually substantially increased. And this is just kind of a visual demonstration of it, of the how much of a disproportion do you have in the green and red between the control and pH patients in the right and the left ventricle. Now, when we did that stimulation test with the nitric oxide, what we surprisingly find out is that there's actually immediate response uh, with respect to uh, with respect to that pulmonary vasodilation, and we observe that the direct flow is uh, post uh, nitric oxide immediately improved, and it's uh, it shows that there is this inert. Uh, uh, ventricular vascular coupling, which is actually observable using a flow hemodynamics. Similarly, that uh, uh, un energetically unfavorable residual volume actually dropped down significantly. 
And uh, those were some encouraging results for us to see. Now, can we actually use this for something better than just you know mapping a physiology and actually use some form of responsiveness to nitric oxide therapy? Similarly, uh, we have seen some trends in the left ventricle, but not as statistically significant. So that response to the right ventricle was much more, much more prominent than to the left ventricle. And this kind of leads to the sort of a golden question, like, can we actually use this to uh, use this tool clinically to assess the ventricular couple, vascular coupling physiology? Can we use it to predict basal reactivity? Can we use it to assess the clinical outcomes? Because out of those 10 patients, only two were basal reactive, but as a collectively, as a group, they actually showed uh, very prominent changes in the ventricular flow hemodynamics. So something something for a future future studies to assess can we actually use this to uh you know aid our base reactivity studies as well as our clinical uh endpoints to, pr pr to predict the clinical endpoints so that's our pr primary next step in our studies to kind of a phenotype different types of pulmonary hypertension is the flow in is, is the flow through the ventricles different in patients with a pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease in patients with a pulmonary hypertension due to copd primary ph uh, can we actually use it more and more efficiently and clinically to screen and to collect more data? The patients, uh, uh, you know, uh, right now we are still hearing that the 4D flow is quite a lengthy sequence. It's not currently, we can actually complete a study, 4D flow study in less than seven minutes and correlate some of these uh, images with the clinical endpoints again. And can we actually assess some longitudinal, uh, longitudinal assessment in the RV changes? Those are my acknowledgements. They all go primarily to Dr. Ivy and to Dr. Frank from the pulmonary hypertension team at Children's Hospital Colorado who drive a vast majority of these studies. And thank you very much for your for your uh, for your um, for the invitation and opportunity to talk. Thank you so much. That was um, such a great talk. And again, I'm sure lots of good questions about that. I have questions on that. Um, but just given the time, and we have three other speakers, um, Nick, you can tell me, and I think it might be best to move on to our other speakers and take all the questions at the end. So please, everyone put your questions in the chat and either the speakers will try to address it in the chat as I see Tilo doing, or we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end, but it can be a dynamic chat session. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, this is a challenging issue because this was initially a two hour uh, session that's been fit into one and a half hours. Uh, thank you, Michael. That was great. And uh, for the reference, uh, the work that uh, you showed that we did was actually with Tilo and Pooja. So it's all in the family. Um, so next I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Susan Hopkins, who I, I, she actually taught me in medical school at UCSD, uh, though she probably doesn't remember me. Uh, I'm, she's going to be talking about uh, uh, the blood and air interface. So uh, can everybody see my screen and can everybody hear me? We can Is see you and hear you. Okay, perfect. So uh, thanks Nick and Pooja for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Oh, and we have the situation where I can't advance my slides. What a joy. Okay, uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, let me just disable the laser pointer. I think that's the problem. Uh, let's see if I can advance my slides. I can. So what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes is give you an overview of the techniques that we have for measuring ventilation perfusion matching with proton MRI with a focus on measuring perfusion with a technique known as arterial spin labeling or ASL. Um, also called arterial spin tagging sometimes. Measurement of ventilation with a technique uh, developed in-house called specific ventilation imaging or SVI. And I'm going to briefly touch on validation and show you one particular application of the technique. I need to remind you that the primary function of the lung is gas exchange. And when we talk about gas exchange, what we're concerned with is alveolar ventilation, which is the delivery of fresh gas to the gas exchange portions of the lung. Once the fresh gas is there, it has to be met with deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary capillary beds. And those two, the flow of fresh gas and the flow of blood must match in order for oxygen and CO2 to diffuse across their concentration gradients. Ventilation perfusion matching is almost universally disrupted in lung disease. 
Now, a great deal of what we understand about ventilation perfusion relationships is derived from data from MIDGET. MIDGET is multiple inert gas elimination technique. And MIDGET relies on principles of mass balance in that gas, does uh, marker gases dissolved in saline, diffused or um, infused in a peripheral vein and then recovered in arterial blood and expired gases. Um, and you an, and analyze those relative concentrations and you can recover a VQ relationship. There's been an awful lot of studies done with midget and it informs much of the modern understanding of pulmonary gas exchange. With midget, you can um, fit data to a 50 compartment model and recover a distribution of ventilation perfusion ratio. This is a histogram and the distribution of ventilation or perfusion to units of different VQ ratio. And the primary metrics that are derived from midget aside from measures of quantitative measures of shunt and dead space is the width of these distributions. And the terminology is it's a log scale, it's the standard deviation, it's the standard deviation of V for ventilation or Q for perfusion. So the log SDV and less log SDQ are the primary midget metrics of VQ inequality. In a patient such as this one with COPD, you can see a rather bizarre distribution that is bimodal and it has these areas of low uh, ventilation but relatively high perfusion that is associated with hypoxemia in this individual. I need to also point out to you that VQ relationships deteriorate as you get older. It's the reason why the alveolar arterial difference widens with age. Um, so that if you are doing VQ studies with normal subjects and patient populations, your controls, you have to match them for age. So the technique that we have to measure ventilation perfusion relationships starts with perfusion. And we use a technique called ASL, arterial spin labeling, fairer, flow sensitive alternating inversion recovery. And proton MRI in the lung is somewhat difficult. And for that reason, we need to do some tricks. It's a rather hostile environment. So arterial spin labeling or arterial spin tagging with, with our technique, we tag an image in the same plane. So here is a sagittal image in a subject lying supine. Here's a phantom, here's the diaphragm, here's the apex. And the first image that we acquire is called the selective inversion. And that means that we tag the protons only in the slice we're planning on imaging. We wait one cardiac cycle, our image is cardiac gated. The protons that have seen the tagging um, pulse flow out of the image plane. Now it turns out that the effect of the tag is to largely null out all the signal. So those protons with their signal largely nulled flow out of our image plane and are replaced by other protons that haven't seen the tag and they make this bright signal with these uh, vascular markings here. In the second image that we acquire, we get a non-selective inversion and that means that we tag your entire torso. Therefore, there are no protons that haven't seen the tag and when they flow in, the signal is largely nulled. We then subtract these two images. We quantify it using the phantom. We correct it for heterogeneity in the image that is based on proximity of the lungs to the uh, torso coil that we use to amplify the signal. We, we lop out these large vessels here um, that are reflective of blood volume and also contain blood that is destined for distal capillary beds. And we're left with a map of perfusion um, in one cardiac cycle. 
and we can quantify this in various ways. The simplest one is with the relative dispersion, which is just the standard deviation of signal intensity over the mean. We also can quantify it in terms of spatial distributions or gravitational gradients looking at the most dependent part of the lung to the non-dependent lung. We've gone to considerable lengths to validate our techniques. Um, first, I'd like to show you data that if for the metric of relative dispersion, if we measure somebody on two occasions, uh, either a week apart or uh, um, uh, uh, on two different imaging sessions on the same day, we get the same number for relative dispersion. We validated our technique in a flow phantom showing that it's linear. And in a preclinical animal model, we validated our technique against microspheres in collaboration with Rob Glenny at the University of Washington. Here is vertical height from the dependent lung and relative dispersion or relative perfusion showing a reasonable agreement between our ASL measurements and microspheres. Turning now to our measurement of ventilation. We measure specific ventilation, which I will remind you is the change in volume over the resting volume. It's the delivery of fresh gas over resident gas or the local tidal volume over FRC ratio. And to do specific ventilation imaging, we rely on the fact that oxygen is paramagnetic and shortens the local T1. So when oxygen comes into contact with tissue, it changes the local MR signal properties. And when you image it with an appropriate MR sequence, you can see that. So what we do is we have a subject lying in the scanner with a face mask and they breathe room air for 20 breaths and then uh, sorry about that, room air for 20 breaths, 100% oxygen for 20 breaths, and so on and so forth. And we monitor on a voxel by voxel basis the rate of change of signal intensity. So it's not the absolute signal intensity, it's how fast a region of lung changes its signal intensity. Areas of high specific ventilation will change signal intensity more quickly. Areas of low specific ventilation will equilibrate more slowly. From that, we can back out a lick-up table and a 50 compartment model fit and come up with a regional specific ventilation map, which you see here. We have validated our technique against multiple breath washout with good agreement and again, in a preclinical animal model, we validated our technique against microspheres. We can express heterogeneity uh, in specific ventilation as the width of a histogram or, um, or the relative dispersion. So I mentioned that we measure uh, specific ventilation, but what we really want is alveolar ventilation, which is specific ventilation is fresh gas over resident gas. And in order to get alveolar ventilation, we have to estimate what the resident gas is. And so in order to do that, we get a proton density sequence and we make the assumption that a proton density scan is a binary compartment of things that are air and things that are not air. And as Tylo pointed out, that not air component is both tissue and blood, but both of those contain protons. And so therefore we calculate alveolar ventilation as specific ventilation times one minus the density to give us that not air compartment and multiply it by the frequency of breathing. And we take our specific ventilation, one minus the density, and here we get a measure of alveolar ventilation showing the well-described gravitational gradient in alveolar ventilation. From there, it's a short hop to combining our ventilation image with our perfusion image to get an image of VQ ratio. I mentioned earlier that we threshold out large vessels we also threshold out areas of, specific, of the lung on the specific ventilation image that don't correlate with the driving function. We can't quantify specific ventilation in there. Um, and so you see these large black areas where the large vessels are taken out and regions that don't correlate with the driving function are taken out. We can get multiple images on our ventilation scan and bang through the lung 
uh, in multiple perfusion images and get an image of VQ ratio in about 25 minutes for one lung. From there, we can quantify and recover distributions fit to a 50 compartment model in exactly the same way as we can uh, do so for midget. Um, our measurement is highly reliable. If we make two measures of VQ, either on different days or on the same day, we get the same number. This is log SDQ across repeated measurements. And we have validated our technique against midget, which is widely considered to be the gold standard. One of the reasons I'm hammering away about the what I feel are extraordinary lengths we've gone to to validate our techniques is that we still get crap in the imaging world about proton MRI being difficult in the lung. And yes, it's difficult. Um, however, with some care and attention in data collection, you get reliable and valid results. So I'd like to now turn to um, an application here to show the power of these techniques. This is a paper that we published this year. Um, it was um, my postdoc, uh, Abilash Kazaki Pulikoti, or KP, um, entirely his idea. And what KP did is he recruited a population, two populations of young subjects, controls and subjects who were vapors. All of these subjects were young. The average age was uh, less than 25. They had no history of lung disease. In fact, they had no history of disease at all. They were on no medications and they, were all, they all had normal pulmonary function. You can see there are some small differences. The vapors were taller. They had a larger FEV1 and, um, and so on, but overall, dead on normal pulmonary function. So if you did spirometry on these vapors, you wouldn't know that they were unusual in any way. When we did our uh, VQ imaging on them, we found that this log SDQ, remember that's the primary metric derived originally from midget of VQ mismatch, was elevated in subjects who were vapors, um, quite markedly actually. Then KP sent them out into the parking lot around the scanner uh, to have a vape. Um, so our baseline measurements were taken after uh, six hours of abstinence. These guys went out into the parking lot, puffed away, and then we hustled them back into the scanner and we acquired another set of images on them. And we found marked increases in ventilation perfusion mismatch. I'd like to put that into perspective for you. This is log SDQ as a function of age. The gray uh, circles are normal subjects, and it is a combination of our MRI data and also the data um, from uh, uh, Midget. The blue dots are patients with gold stage one COPD. The red circles are the vapors at baseline, and the black circles are the vapors after they vaped. So I want you to consider what's going to happen to this 22 year old when he becomes 60 or 70 or 80. He has already markedly impaired. And if you just did spirometry on these guys, you wouldn't know that there was anything unusual about this individual. So I hope I've convinced you that proton MRI can provide valid and reproducible measures of ventilation perfusion mismatch. And these functional measures are highly sensitive and can measure abnormalities even when conventional tests of pulmonary function are normal. It really takes a village uh, to do these kinds of experiments and there are a large number of people that have contributed to them. I wish I had time to acknowledge them all. But I thank you for your attention and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share this with you today. Thank you.
Um, I wish there was a way to clap. That was uh, an amazing presentation. And in particular, I'll be sending that vape picture to uh, my patients uh, who, who claim that vaping is totally okay. Honestly, um, I think they're better off smoking. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but... Um, there may be some truth to that. Um, so so um, it's my pleasure to then uh, announce Dr. Jan de Bakker. He is the CEO of Fluida, a company based in Belgium that has, uh, over the past uh, many years, developed a, a tremendous amount of expertise in lung imaging. Um, please. Great. Thank you so very much for the, uh, the kind introduction. Um, I think the session was uh, entitled uh, Modern Imaging Tools for Timeless Questions. And I think it's fair to say that probably COVID-19 will be one of those timeless questions that we will be unraveling uh, for the next few years. So that's why I wanted to take a few minutes to, to walk you through some of the uh, insights we've obtained in COVID-19 using uh, functional respiratory imaging. So functional respiratory imaging starts from conventional high resolution, low dose CT scans. And as you know, typically you have a radiologist looking through those 2D images looking for abnormal patterns. What functional respiratory imaging does, it, it takes these images and converts it into uh, 3D geometries of the anatomical structures, such as the airways, the blood vessels, the lung volumes, and so on. And as we've seen before, if we have inspiratory expiratory scans, we can also make those static images come to life and add functionality to it, really understanding regional ventilation, resistances, aerosol deposition patterns, and so on. So actually by just taking two low dose CT scans that they're taking three to five seconds to acquire, we actually have a very comprehensive set of parameters that can help to uh, look at uh, lung diseases and better understand them and also look at interventions. And in this talk, we'll definitely like to uh, focus on the pulmonary vasculature. Um, so what we did, especially in COVID-19, was uh, use these uh, CT scans to reconstruct the pulmonary vasculature in 3D and then look at the different sizes of the vessels. So here on the right-hand side, you see those red zones, which are these smaller vessels with a cross-sectional area below five millimeters squared. We have the mid-size and the larger vessels. And also Dr. Rahagi did some great work on that uh, previously, and we are building on uh, the body of evidence to really understand the vasculopathy in the different diseases, including some of these respiratory infections. So actually what you do by uh, doing this type of analysis, you see how the blood volume that is visible in the CT scan, how that blood volume is distributed over the different sizes of the vessels. And here you see the, the healthy line, the blue line, which is about 108 healthy volunteers. You see that the standard deviation on that line is limited. You see in COVID-19 that you do see a deviation from that healthy line which seems to be characterized by some vasoconstriction, vasoocclusion in these smaller vessels, and then some compensatory vasodilation in these mid-sized and these larger vessels. So if you look at the 3D image, you clearly see that in the COVID-19 patients, you don't see too many red zones anymore, but you do see mainly the dilation of these uh, mid-sized and these larger vessels. You also see that this vasculopathy tends to be uh, present throughout the lungs, so not just limited to the areas where you typically would see the ground glass opacity. And we'll come to, back to that in, in a few slides. So one of the major questions in this pandemic was, of course, could we predict whether a patient would require intensive care, intubation, so on, or whether the patient would be okay? So we set out to do this was to see uh, with a great collaboration with Banner Health and University of Arizona. So we enrolled about 508 patients, uh, including both COVID-19 positive and negative patients. It was a multi-center study with 10 hospitals. And we looked at the uh, CT scan that was taken within 24 hours of hospital admission. And the idea was to see, could we predict mortality and the need for intubation? We corrected for anything that could influence the results, including anticoagulant treatment, steroids, remdesivir, and so on. If you looked at the results, you actually saw quite a large range of disease severity. So we had patients where we saw very little red zones, so very little uh, smaller vessels present. Uh, we also had other patients with a more normal image in terms of their BV5. So remember the BV5 is a quantification of the small uh, blood vessel volume. 
So if you looked at these odds ratios, you actually saw that specifically in the COVID-19 positive group, the BV5, so again, the small blood vessel volume, was highly predictive of mortality, intubation, or the combination of both. And especially for patients with very little BV5 left, the odds ratios were specifically high, so almost up to six. In the COVID-19 negative group, interestingly, these values were not yet significant. So it seems that the vasculopathy really seems to be a hallmark feature of COVID-19. This is the correlation uh, between the BV5, so the small blood vessel volume, and the typical ground glass opacity that you would uh, quantify in the CT scans. So you do see a correlation where areas with more ground glass opacity tend to have lower BV5s. But very importantly, you already have areas with little or no ground glass opacity that already have significant reduction in the BV5. And this means that if you combine H and BV5, you get accuracies to predict death or intubation of about 80 to 85%. So this allows us to create graphs like you see here on the right-hand side, where you see as a function of the H and the BV5 for a specific patient, what the probability of death or intubation would be. So it's being used in, in hospitals around the world for really helping to triage the patients once they come in, uh, into the hospital, especially in areas or in times with scarce resources, this is quite useful to understand which patients uh, require the more intensive care. So this paper was published in the, the ERJ uh, very recently with a, quite a nice editorial uh, where the editor said that the time will tell whether quantitative CT analysis can or indeed should be integrated into routine respiratory practice. The present study represents definite progress building on a steadily growing body of work, suggesting that this time may be approaching. And I think it's thanks to all of these uh, excellent speakers also in this session uh, that we are gradually moving towards more routine applications of imaging in the respiratory space. So we, we heard a lot about ventilation, perfusion, matching and mismatching. And that, of course, is also a, an important topic in uh, COVID-19. So by having an inspiratory and expiratory scan, we can look at the regional ventilation patterns. And by combining it with the indication of pulmonary vasculature, we can have an indication of what we're dealing here with in terms of uh, VQ matching and mismatch. So this is a data that we uh, collected in collaboration with a site in, in Brazil, where they early on in, in the pandemic used inspiratory expiratory scans to kind of even diagnose these patients with uh, COVID-19. So this data allowed us to create some of these graphs. We're on the vertical axis, you have the low bar BV5 expresses a percent predicted, so 100% is normal. And on the horizontal axis, you have the low bar ventilation, again, expresses a percent predicted. So that takes into account age, gender, height. So the unit line is the VQ matching line. So you can see that most of these patients are really characterized by dead space ventilation. So it seems that the ventilation in many of these patients is still reasonably okay, but it's, it's very much a vasculopathy issue that kind of uh, make, creates an imbalance uh, in, in these particular patients. If you look at some of them, you can actually also nicely see that. So if you look at uh, on the right-hand side, the ventilation, so the red zones indicate, indicate elevated ventilation. So here in this case, the lower lobes seem to be fairly well ventilated. You also see that in the lower lobes where you see a fairly high degree of vasculopathy, so more blue areas, more dilation of these larger vessels and disappearance of these, uh, these smaller vessels, the, the, the BV5 fraction. One of the uh, questions I'm sure we'll be looking into for the next few years is, are we in it for the long haul? So you hear a lot about long haulers. So what about the recovery trajectory of these patients? Um, and there we, we were, of course, looking at the vessels, but also at the airways. So what we did here in collaboration with Temple is really looking at a cohort several weeks after discharge from the hospital and look at their airway volumes. And you can see them during visit zero, the hospitalization, that on average, the airway volume extracted from the CT scan is significantly below what you would typically expect in a healthy cohort, which is probably normal, a lot of inflammation, so a lot of bronchoconstriction. But you do see that several weeks, 10, 17 weeks post-discharge, 
it takes a very long time for these patients to get um, closer to that normal healthy range. Also visually, actually, you wouldn't see a great difference visually. So if you just look at the CT scan, and that's the tragic part. So if you just look at the CT scan, these patients seem to be fairly normal. But if you measure these airway volumes, for instance, in this case of this long holer, it's only 31% of what it should be. So significant uh, bronchial constriction that you can uh, measure in the CT scan, but it's very hard to see uh, in any other way. Also, the, the, the vasculature in these uh, long holers tends to, be, tends to remain abnormal for a long period of time. So here, again, you see the correlation between the low bar BV5 and the ground glass opacity. So it seems that the ground glass opacity tends to resolve fairly well, not too many dots here on the right-hand side, but there are very many dots that are still outside of this normal range. So you can visually see that in the long-term COVID, it's not as bad as it is in the acute case, but we're not quite healthy yet. So there's still a lot to uh, look into COVID-19, especially in these patients that remain symptomatic for a very long period of time. So I think the, the, the pandemic has shown that there's a tremendous unmet need still to um, understand lung diseases and really understand the treatments as well, so we can optimize the matching between the right patient and the right treatment. Uh, I think luckily new imaging modalities provide scalable and readily available solutions both for lung disease understanding as well as treatment uh, selection. AI and deep learning are, I think, very powerful tools, but we always have to couple it with clinical outcomes in order to make sure that we're using the right technologies for the right reasons. And if we do so, I do think um, we can substantially improve the care for these respiratory patients in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan, for a great uh, uh, talk and so many very interesting results. Um, at this point, we're gonna, uh, the plan is to continue even though we're gonna run over a little bit. Uh, and please send your uh, um, questions through the chat. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce, lastly but not leastly, uh, Dr. Marin Tofai, and I, I watched a small YouTube video about exactly how to say that F, but I think I still messed it up. Uh, she is uh, joining us from New Zealand. So thank you very much for uh, making the time and joining us. And uh, uh, as always, look forward to an interesting talk. Thanks, Nick. Can you just um, raise your hand if you can hear me fine? Great. Okay, so yes, last talk of the day. Uh, I've been tasked with um, explaining how we bring all of this together, how we integrate um, information from different imaging modalities um, and other data into quantitative models. Um, so first, a declaration, uh, independent director of ISON, um, which uh, does not have any conflict of interest uh, with this work. So first, a motivation before we get into, you know, what's the why before we get into the how. Um, so one of the things that we want to be able to do is to link this fantastic quantitative imaging that we've already seen with physiological measurements. Um, the traditional approach, of course, is to do a statistical analysis, um, but, but statistics can tell us some clues about you know, association, um, but doesn't necessarily tell us enough about um, the physiology or the mechanism. So why do we have you know, a mechanistic association between uh, what we see on imaging and what the other you know, measurements we get from uh, patients? Um, we also want to understand the mechanistic basis of specific imaging-based biomarkers. So as these novel imaging technologies transfer into um, accepted clinical biomarkers, actually, what is the mechanistic basis? That gives us um, information you know, about um, potential new treatment targets um, and also confidence that these biomarkers are relevant to specific patient populations. Um, some of the um, imaging that you've seen today, for example, the oxygen enhanced uh, MRI includes assumptions um, in the way that we extract functional information from imaging. Um, so, um, you know, there are equations, um, calculations and assumptions underlying um, the extraction of information. 
And biophysically based data driven models can be used to um, evaluate um, the assumptions um, in imaging. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to predict patient response to treatment. So using patient specific biophysically based models to predict response to drug treatment, um, device interaction or other interventions. So what we've been doing is to develop a modeling platform that allows us to um, derive patient specific models from imaging um, of structure and function and also population based models. So we use imaging um, across some of this, you know, we, we obviously have not not yet dived into all of the different imaging modalities that could be integrated uh, into this sort of modeling framework or used for model validation. Uh, we've largely relied on volumetric CT and um, functional MR. So we use imaging to um, derive structure uh, to inform models of tissue mechanics. Um, mechanics is then linked to both ventilation and perfusion. Um, and ultimately, as Sue pointed out, gas exchange. You know, that's really ultimately what we are interested in is how can we link um, our imaging based measurements and other patient uh, physiological measurements to prediction and understanding of gas exchange. So in the interest of time, I will only be looking at uh, structure and perfusion today, just giving you some indication of what uh, information we can get and approaches that we take uh, in these areas. So first, in terms of um, structure-based models, um, as I said, you know, we focus on making patient-specific models. So one individual's uh, imaging, we can derive uh, models of lungs, lobes, uh, fissure boundaries, um, airways and blood vessels. And, and it's important that we do this on a patient specific basis if we really want to make the link between um, 3D spatial distribution of pathology, for example, on CT, um, make that link between what we see spatially and um, what is measured functionally um, through standard pulmonary function measurements. However, it's also really important to develop population based models. Um, because we have the risk that if we just develop a whole lot of patient specific models, we end up really not having any more insight than if we simply were analyzing measurements. You know, if our goal is to really understand the physiology and the connection between um, imaging and uh, functional outcomes, then we really need to understand what influences, um, you know, what, what and what structure might influence a functional outcome. And to do that, we need population-based approaches. So we started off with this really um, looking at structure. Can we actually model structure um, across um, a normal healthy cohort? Um, so we've used um, data from normal subjects from two centers age 20 to 93 years of age. These are all normals, uh, even the very older subjects with respect to their radiology and their lung function testing. So normal for their age. Um, and we've used principal component analysis um, to derive statistical shape models um, for this cohort. What this gives us is an average shape model, which you see here um, on the screen, um, and also the principal modes of shape variation. So the main ways in which shape varies across this particular cohort. Um, so we had an interesting finding from this. Um, so this was work of a former PhD student, um, which if we first look at the, at the graph on the uh, right, you will see our first principal shape mode against age. Um, and so what we are seeing here is quite a strong relationship between shape and age um, in a healthy cohort. Um, so reasonably predictive um, of shape. And you can see on the left hand side, um, two standard deviations uh, away from the average shape for the first two principal shape modes. So characteristic shape for the older subjects with the minus two standard deviations and for the older uh, younger subjects with the plus two standard deviations. So it's giving us a quantitative description of um, just lung and fissure 
shape. And I should mention that um, this is, of course, related to chest wall remodeling in terms of that outer shape, um, but also to movement of the fissures, um, which you can actually see if you look at that uh, top row um, of, the, of the figure of the, of the lung shapes. So how can we use that information? Um, well, we're also quite interested in because we you know, come from a biomechanics um, sort of area, we're interested in lung tissue mechanics. And IPF is, uh, from a mechanics perspective, is, is a really interesting um, area to be looking at. Um, so we took, um, took subjects um, diagnosed with IPF um, and have uh, derived shape models um, for this cohort and compared with an age matched group. So not with the whole model from the 20 to 93 years of age, just with subjects aged over 50 years. So same as our IPF cohort. Um, what you see here is, is the normal model for the, um, for the over 50s. So the over 50 healthy subjects um, and models just some sample models from IPF. Now, if we just eyeball this, we can perhaps see some differences, some similarities, um, but of course the power of doing a quantitative analysis um, is that you actually find out whether there are differences. And we do see um, significant difference, essentially a clustering of the IPF subjects compared with our controls. So there's a distinct, a shape distinction. Um, right, so we were wondering whether we had any issue here with gender, with sex, sorry, because um, we have largely males in our IPF cohort. Um, so you can see though there is no sex difference. Orange are our IPFs. Um, so this is mode one and two shape um, against each other. Um, and blue and gray are our males and females. So there is no consistent difference in the healthy cohort in shape, um, male and female are similar to each other. Now I should say that in all of our work, we have removed volume. Um, clearly there are volume differences between male and female, um, but we removed that from the analysis. So we're purely looking at shape. So interesting um, shape differences, but what could that be related to? Um, well, of course we suspect, you know, the percentage of fibrosis because it, as, the, as we develop IPF um, with the mechanical changes in the tissue that will constrict the tissue and potentially um, influence shape. So is there a clear relationship? Well, we've um, used the caliper software um, with, um, Brian Bartholme and co from the Mayo Clinic um, to do a tissue texture um, classification to quantify the proportion of lung that is fibrosis. And what we find is that across the four first principle shape modes, that there is um, quite a strong relationship with percentage of fibrosis. Interestingly, what we've found in our patients who have follow-up imaging is that um, their lung shape is consistent across the entire time span, and this is going out to three years or more, that their shape is different from normals, but it's not changing over time, uh, which makes us wonder about what, exactly what is going on. Are they, do they have an abnormal shape from the start that is driving a, an abnormal um, mechanical um, response um, and therefore development of fibrosis? Um, but that's work that remains to be done. So just to go on to the last part here, um, I wanted to talk about the vasculature, which is great. Thank you, Jan, for your previous um, beautiful imaging um, and work you've been doing in the vasculature, which is a nice segue into, into this. Um, so in terms of introducing imaging into um, predictive models of vascular function, um, so we previously um, used CTPAs um, from patients with acute pulmonary embolism. Um, on the left, you can see a 3D rendering of the vessels with emboli in place. Uh, what we can do with this is then to, to generate structure-based models and simulate perfusion distribution and then gas exchange in response to obstruction. What we found doing this on a cohort of 12 patients was that um, our model, model prediction 
of the um, capacity for a decrease in um, arterial oxygen was um, strongly predictive of estimated systolic pulmonary artery pressure. Um, in fact, uh, more predictive than um, the ratio of uh, pulmonary artery to aorta diameter um, and to other suggested metrics um, of severity. So it just sort of um, indicates that uh, modeling itself when you have structure-based data informed uh, can give you some useful new in information that in itself can act as biomarkers. Finally, um, where we're moving now is trying to link um, spatially distributed contrast um, perfusion imaging with um, right heart catheter measurements of um, pulmonary artery pressure. So how we go about doing this, um, we are taking uh, contrast enhanced imaging, um, we are linking, generating our structure based models, um, doing our simulation of normal to understand what would this, um, what would the distribution of perfusion be like if we didn't have um, any remodeling of the, of the vasculature or tissue. Um, we are then mapping vessels, um, our small vessels, to the uh, intensity in the um, perfusion imaging, contrast imaging, and making the um, grand assumption that perfusion is proportional um, to intensity. Um, at least this is a starting point. From this, we can sum the flow um, throughout the tree to give us a flow map um, through our model. So what you see in the bottom right hand side of the bottom row is a flow map calculated for a subject with um, CTF and in the top for the normal version of that of that model. So we are seeing um, we see a gravitational distribution in the top healthy panel and in the bottom panel we see less gravitational distribution and regions of um, constricted um, vessels where we have some interesting um, increased um, perfusion. Now to link this to right heart cath measurements, um, we have a model for pulsatile perfusion. Um, so a time dependent uh, wave transmission model, um, which allows us then to um, introduce right heart catheter waveforms um, and then simulate um, perfusion. So we simulate our um, impedance throughout um, the tree. So I'm hoping that uh, by next year's ATS, we will be able to show you some lovely results um, that uh, link the spatial information um, to right heart cath measurements. So I'll leave you at that point. Thanks. Thank you, Marin. Uh, very, I'm always blown away by, by the complexity of the modeling that you guys do. Uh, it, it, it's truly amazing. Um, so I think this was a sort of a flash, uh, you know, condensed almost like, a, you know, where they get the shark tank, give your pitch version of like all of, you know, a significant portion of physiology and imaging. Uh, uh, I think, um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, uh, and for, for particularly for dealing with our compressed time frame, uh, which I realize is very challenging. Um, and for ATS for bringing this session back to life uh, after we thought that it had gone away. Um, um, Pooja or, or Kim, I'll defer to you guys. I'll just, this is Kim, I'll just chime in and say thanks again to everybody. I mean. These are all stunning talks, and the tragedy is you can't gather around and say, hey, what about? I mean, yes, the chat's lovely. So I look forward to um, doing something like this next year. And if you've got questions, those in the audience, um, hold them till next year. Hopefully we can actually talk about this. I mean, some of the stuff is stunning. Uh, I was reflecting on just how far the modelling, uh, thinking of Jan and, and Merrin's talks, has come over the years and, and how much information it's imparting. So I think uh, that's probably a stunning, stunning session, guys. Lovely. Thank you very much.
Agreed. I just want to echo what Nick and um, Dr. Prisk have said. Um, thank you so much for, for attending. Um, and if there's extra questions, I think I see everyone answered the questions in the chat, which I appreciate. Um, and hopefully we can keep the conversation going next, next year in person.